Hi, I'm Chris Lezak. I am a felt artist and I did the green apples right here. Um, people, when they see this, they have no idea what it takes to make this piece of fabric here. And I try to carry in my pocket this. And this is merino roving. Um, it's straight from the sheep. That's natural, that's dyed. And the body of this, other than the embellishment, is made only from that. You add hot water and soap and agitate it for a long period of time and eventually you get this. And that is actually a cross section of what that looks like. So that's how thick that is. You can see it's very sturdy. Um, it's very solid. So the process that I used to, to do this, well, when I first got the picture, uh, I wasn't sure how I was gonna do it. I decided I would do the faded leaves in the background um, and the sky in one piece. And the piece as it stands is uh, 54 inches by 18 inches. I had to make it 40% larger than that because of course the end product will shrink. And so what I did was I uh, laid out um, layers of, of the natural roving, um, about six layers of that crossed like this. Um, and then a couple of layers of blue and then some more blue to get the, uh, the sort of grain in the sky. And then I laid down some uh, leaves that I cut from pre-felt, which is about three or four layers um, just wet together in the different colors of leaves. And that would be the, the background leaves in here. Laid them down and then I wet the whole thing with hot soapy water. I rolled it up with a pool noodle and large um, bubble wrap into a big roll, it was very big and very wet, and then I had to rub that, and I had to rub that for about half an hour, and then I'd unroll it, flip it the other way, and rub it for another half hour, and then I would repeat that process about eight times. Um, I couldn't do it all in one day, it was too physical. Uh, when I eventually got it so that all the fibers were really locked together, but it hadn't started shrinking, that's step one done, that's the, the actual felting. And then what you do is you take it to a hot bath. So I have a double sink, big um, sink full of hot soapy water, as hot as I can stand it with rubber gloves on it. And I plunge the whole thing into that, agitate it around just like a washing machine for about 15 minutes, plunge it in the other side, soak it down with really cold water, and then wring it right out. And then I take the whole blob of fabric and I really have a lot of fun. I smash it down into the sink really hard, pounding it, for about, uh, about 20 times. Um, this shocks the fiber into shrinking upon itself and that's what makes it get smaller and that's what makes it pebble. You can see it's sort of little bumps and, and nubs all over it. That process of hot, cold pounding is repeated about, usually about three or four times for a scarf. This one I had to do six times and I let it dry and it still wasn't shrunk enough so I did it about six more times the next day and that made a very dense piece of fabric in which to work with. The leaves and the apples are done in a wet felting about six layers, like the scarves. Um, I did several different pieces with all the different colors and what you can see in here is uh, lots of different colors. Um, there's some silk, um, the lighter color on the back side of this one, the darker color on the back side of that one because I knew I wanted to roll the edges. So I did all the different colors there. And then the apples with the textures in there and again a bit of the silk to give a bit of sheen to it and a bit of the dark piece because that's the bottom of the apple there. And once those pieces were all the stages and shrunk down, then I cut them into the shapes that I wanted. Um, I embroidered the uh, veins in there. I, I knit the main branch, uh, knit the little branches there. And then I started embellishing with, there's the, little beads and large beads to give the apple some shine and there's some dark beads up the stem to make it look more like a, a branch and basically that's all the work there and it looks very easy right <laughs> uh, and i and i just had so much fun doing it it's the largest piece i've ever done uh, mostly i work with clothing um, scarves and coats and uh, um, I've done some purses. Uh, I did one small pictorial that about this big, so this is the largest piece I've done, and I'm very proud of it. And I really want to thank the uh, Cultural Capital of Canada um, group, and especially uh, Diana and Nina, for uh, having me involved in this 
wonderful ins installation. It was a blast. This one does have a subtle political statement about it, about the loss of the tender fruit. And um, a lot of the work I done in my previous panels, previous work, does deal with time as a vehicle for change and transformation. So uh, this piece fits in with that body of work that I've been doing, and that's why you'll see the little watch parts in it. So this was the photograph the original photographs of the baskets. And when I first saw it, I thought, ooh, this is complicated. How am I gonna tackle it? Am I gonna do very realistically and, um, you know, reproduce each shape? So I actually did a little test tile in case I was going to do that to find out about shrinkage in case I wanted to do it. And I thought, no, I can't do it like that. I have to go back to my own technique. So, and my regular technique is porcelain. It's a high fired porcelain which I like because it's it's hard. It's not soft at all. Depending on the temperature of the firing, the, the porcelain can stay kind of chalky or at high fire it's nice and hard. So, And this is what I work with in my panels. So I roll it out very thin like this. I thought okay now how am I going to relate this to fruit and to the tender, you know, to, to the subject. So I came up with the idea of having these stamps made. And they, are, they have cherries and the little icons, peaches, also letters. I use a lot of dates and numbers in my regular pieces too. And I thought this would apply to as far as the growing season in Niagara. So that's how these are done. These are all stamped into these porcelain sheets. So here you can see how the impressions in the clay look once I've stamped them all. And my hands look the way they do because I've done a lot of work with them, right? It's, it's quite physical. Then I apply what's called an iron chromate. And um, it's a, in a powder form. You mix it with water and you brush it on. So after you you've have applied the iron chromate, you have to wipe it off, of course, so it stays just in the impression and the light of the porcelain comes back up. So now it's ready to be fired in a kiln. It's one firing. Usually a potter does two firing, one with, with uh, a bisque, it's called, but I do one firing with mine. It takes it right up to the cone nine, to the high temperature, because I'm not wor really working with glazes at all. So it's one firing, and here they're, um, I fill a kiln with them. And then um, we start to attach them to the board. I use a mastic to set the tile because it's basically like a floor, the way you would have a bathroom floor or a kitchen floor. It's the same process. It's a very, very um, strong adhesive. I mean, I've had some of these fall and they, they don't, <laughs> it doesn't come out. It's a really good. Okay, then now I have my drawing. So the whole panel's done, and yes, it still looks like all those baskets, and now it's ready for the black grout. Okay, so this is a finished piece, basically, with the, the black line accented with the grout, and I use a stain for the color that's in the piece. It's not a glaze, but it's a very permanent. It's actually a fabric stain. It's a French dye which is very, very permanent. And that way you can control the shading of the piece. You don't want it too strong, you just want a subtle color to it. And um, yeah, so that's, that's the finished piece. And that is basically the process. My name is Ezra Mullen, and uh, this is my piece. Um, it was uh, a photograph taken by a photographer called Olga Piedrahita. The 
reason I was really excited to see this piece when I first saw the photograph was the colors in it. I just loved the intensity of the colors um, in the original photograph. They were so beautiful and it was, I, I felt really lucky to, to be able to work with a piece that had so much color in it. Um, I think the main feature of the piece that struck me really was the color um, because it's just basically the two, the green and the pinks. Um, so there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, other elements as far as uh, different uh, different um, uh, complex elements, uh, those weren't present. So I really, uh, the inspiration for me was mainly the color. And I interpreted it in a way that the color was the main focus, remained the main focus. I did, uh, at one point, try to put more texture into the background, but then I realized that that was taking away from the, 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 um, the foreground and I, I scrapped that idea and started all over again. So mainly it's just the color. I have used a few techniques here. I usually work with very small textile pieces. So this was the sheer size of it was uh, intimidating as well to begin with. Um, but when I started to, to work on it, the color kind of carried through um, the piece. Um, as far as technique, mainly I have used uh, quilting um, and painting. So it's uh, the flowers are all painted by hand. I used acrylic paint. I did most of the shading in paint. The background is a couple of different layers of transparent material uh, painted individually and then layered on. There's a lot of uh, hand stitching, there's a lot of machine stitching, and of course there's a lot of beading. So um, again, I, I try to keep the color as a main focus. I have used materials uh, that I haven't used ever before, which is um, this part, the bark part, is actually um, something called paper cloth. And uh, what I did that uh, with that is I layered pieces of material and tissue paper, one on top of the other, until they became something called paper cloth. You layer them with glue. And once it's ready and dry, it, it can work it like cloth, but at the same time, it behaves like paper. It doesn't fray. So it was really good to work with that. I used the um, machine stitching on top of that, and that provided some of the texture. I've used yarn here, um, again, for depth and, and, um, and, and texture. This is all paper. So it's, it's mainly materials. Uh, the main materials I've used here are fabric and paper, really, and of course, the beading. Um, that's about it. it. It's not it's not a very complex piece uh, as far as techniques are concerned. There's only a few few main things that I've done. Um, the main thing really was for me the color and and keeping that integrity intact. I I really want to express my appreciation for the Niagara region for giving me this opportunity. I don't think I would have ventured into such a huge piece by myself. So it was a really eye-opening experience for me. And that was uh, very exciting to work with, such a large piece for me. I also want to thank Diane and Nina for their amazing support. And I'm so thankful to be part of this wonderful, amazing, talented group. Um, to sum up, I would say definitely it has been a, a very rewarding and enriching experience for me and I, I really hope that I will keep this as a milestone for my future endeavors. Hi, I'm Al Cote and I'm a mixed media artist and I've concentrated the last couple of years with working with fiber. Um, I'm privileged enough to be 
part of the textile project for the region. Uh, and it is a triptych, which is three pieces that combined together will make one full picture. They will be stretched on frames separately and then hung as one piece. So there'll be three separate pieces that make one complete piece in the end. There's three artists. We're all working from the same photo and we've divided it into three. And I'm working on the left section of the third. Um, so this is the original third of the photo that I'm working on. And you can see I've, worked, I've got all the length of it done. And what I've done is just basically lined up the colors in sections so that I have the proportions right. Um, this is a very realistic uh, photo. And I'm trying to keep still my look as an artist, my signature look, um, in my style. The first thing I need to do is have a base for the background of this um, piece I'm making. And rather than have one solid color and then add so colors on top of that after, I'm going to do it all in one process. So I've selected the colors that I want and the fabrics that I want and I'm, I'm now I'm going to cut them and show how to sew so you don't get a, a, a complete straight stripe. You'll get wavy curves and you'll get uh, a little bit more effective look that way. So these are the two pieces I picked first, the two colors. So I'm going to lay the one on top of the other and then rather than using a ruler and cutting with the rotary cutter, I'm just going to make a curve like that. Okay, now I have two pieces. So I'm going to remove this one and I'm going to use that one. I'm going to sew those two together that way. So once you have those two pieces sewn together, you select the next color you want, you lay it on top there again and you're going to cut again. You move this one away and that one and you'll sew that together. The texture is very important especially when it comes to the rocks. The rocks you don't want them smooth like the fabric is naturally. So I've selected the fabric that I want for the rocks and this is the process that I use to create the crevices in the rocks and to give it some depth. So I've wet my piece of fabric and I have a hot iron. I've wrinkled it up just with my hands and I take a hot iron and I just press the steam on it. And then I'll take some spray starch and keep doing this until it's dry. And then to give it a nice edge, I fold these under. Okay, I'm trying to find a lot of different things to use for, to give it different textures. And I found these great feathers that'll give it a little bit of a mossy kind of feathery look. But I also have some moss that I will sew inside. And these uh, twigs I've made from silk and my branch here that I found. So now I'm building, I'm going to build up a thickness and a dimension. Um, the hardest thing to do is when you're working from a realistic picture, um, especially with leaves, leaves, there's clumps of leaves, and instead of doing every individual leaf, um, you want to do an illusion of a group of leaves, and that's when the fabric works the best for you, because you can cut the overall shape of an entire clump of leaves, but you can isolate by stitching with the sewing um, to make it look like there are smaller individual leaves inside that big piece. Okay, one of the biggest challenges of this piece to me were, was, is the water. Uh, we tend to think of water as really, really powerful, especially when it's rushing over the rocks. It's very hard to portray that and yet look misty too. Um, the selections that I've come up with are these uh, uh, tool, and I will sew it down like onto the cloth, put the green underneath, and then I will rip this and fray this. The um, heavier water, I will use the roving, because it'll give me the, the solid white for the thickness of the flow, and then yet the water can disappear into smaller streams this way. Um, how I'm going to quilt this piece in the end is with a long arm machine, which is an industrial type of sewing machine that you work manually. Um, it allows you to put very large pieces 
onto a frame. Hi, I'm Susie Dwar. I am an American living in Canada for the last 20 years, originally from Cleveland. I am an artist and a trained educator. I have been working in this studio for 24 years and I also teach in the public schools part-time and I did teach at Buffalo State College in the textile design department. My, my trials with green, when I received the photograph to repeat it, I turned to a friend and whispered, I didn't want to make a public announcement, I hate green. I don't like green, especially tree green, because it can be a cliche when you have to repeat it. It really disturbed me and I didn't know how I was going to finish this project. One day I went outside and sat in my chair and I stared at, up at the trees I went and got a beer in a green bottle and I played classical music and I said, Trees, how do I do this? And it hit me after half the beer that I am going to recreate the sound of the trees, the wind, the rustling of the leaves, the light coming through, that, that beautiful sensuous experience of being under that tree and looking up and the sound of the tree. The wax is about 360 degrees and I have these homemade stamps made out of cording and varnish and they're dipped into the hot beeswax. I wait a few minutes, heat that up and uh, lately there have been a lot of bees coming and visiting me because I'm attracting the bees in the garden and you can see it's melted now. I dip and I press and press and dip and I go on different angles almost like 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 foliage there's a bee right now look at that here he is there's this is the roots that were this is a root stamp so I'll do a section of roots and I have to lift this up so it doesn't stick to the paper you have to move quickly on this and it, a lot of it is very Spontaneous. You just work with what you get, and that's the beauty of it. And then this little tool, this is for drawing, and it has a little weld in it, and the hot wax goes inside, and then it runs out, and you can draw details with this. So I did a lot of drawing particular foliage, roots, rocks, and I end up with the wax paper ready to paint been waxed and then they are covered in and painted with the washes, the acrylic washes and combining and layering the colors that I saw in the uh, photograph. After the uh, paint dries, then I take newsprint and I heat and I pull and melt the wax out from the newsprint and lift it off. If you ever spill candle wax on a tablecloth, this is how you get it out. So we just remove this. You can see the wax showing up and then we just keep removing and removing until the wax has been totally removed. You can feel it. Sometimes the wax can be left in a little bit. It's, it has a nice honey color to it because it is beeswax. And this this was done on white paper, so the white shows through. This was waxed on already a green paper to get that deep, dark foliage. And then I painted darker, darker green over the tops. I have collected wood and sticks, been fascinated with the repetition of sticks for at least 20 years. Uh, photographing them, I paint them, I use them in my sculptures, so this time around, I was able to use them in the root system of the tree, which I found very easy and the most rewarding on this project. Um, 
This has been a truly interesting process. Uh, it's finally I get to use my beach class, my green beach class. I've been collecting for 15 years. I really never liked green, but I found a use for it. And uh, the sticks in the yard, and I really am living with trees. I really have a reverence for trees now from the roots all the way up to the sky. And I'm looking forward to seeing the other two panels next to me. They're really incredible quilters. Hi, I'm Irma Bull and I'm working on the textile art project for the cultural capital of Canada in uh, Niagara. Uh, my first thought was I can't believe that, that they chose me and my second thought was oh my goodness what have I got myself into? <laughs> There's so much to do and there, the, the project that I have has so many green leaves and how do you get that feeling that, that the leaves are moving and that um, there's different colors in the leaves as well. So it took, took me a while to, to get over that. And I think it's the creative process where you, you kind of feel that you can't possibly do this and then you kind of play around and then you realize it's okay, everybody is feeling like that. We're all feeling overwhelmed that we can't, can't do it and yet you find a path and you find a way to do it. And just one thing builds on the other. No. I was really lucky because I was able to go to all the fabric stores in Niagara and I bought fabrics. And just to make sure that I didn't get confused, I put them all in these little little bits. So I had lots of fun and I also went to Value Village and got little pieces of yarn and also got these little bits and pieces from the dryer that I'd saved. And anything you have you can you can put into the, the quilt but we just love the colors and the, the different ideas. Some of them went into the quilt and some of them didn't make it. All right, I had decided to, to use different fabrics to complement what I had, but some of them were just too heavy and I wanted some lacy kind of look. So I couldn't find anything in, in the stores or in my stash. So I got cheesecloth and just with an ordinary brush, I just painted it and I like the the effect because you get different different colors if you add different ones and you can twist it and it really makes it a kind of a nice effect. And I also dyed silks and I used uh, markers and then I painted the the silk and that was great fun. I actually had these in my basement and I forgot all about them and voila there they were. <laughs> great to have these spines. This stuff is great fun. It's so pliable and you just kind of shape it and you can mix the colors in together and twist them and you get something totally different. So I, I baked it in the oven and it, it turns out like this and it, it's, it's quite hard and solid and you can, you can see the, the different, different kinds of colors in it. Yeah, that's the fun of these projects. You just you just get to play. I'm always collecting pebbles. In fact, my garage is full of boxes and pails of pebbles, much to my husband's chagrin. So I use them in uh, in my gardening, and uh, I'll use them in art projects. I've sometimes put them on quilts, and uh, now I started doing mosaics, so that he doesn't feel that it's a useless thing to have all these pebbles around the house. <laughs> This stuff is great too. You can find this in construction sites. Uh, usually they're, they're cutting stuff off and they have a few loose pieces. So whenever I see that, I just pick one up. And all you do is take an iron, or, or you can take a heat gun, I've tried both, 
and as soon as you have the iron hot enough, the stuff, it just pops up like this. And then you can paint it or you, it's easy to sew through there. You can, you can sew beads onto that so you can attach it to your fabric and it's, it's not hard, but it looks almost like rocks. It's great stuff. This was actually a, a brilliant idea that my friend Roberta came up with. And uh, she, uh, she suggested that, that we just put this on plastic. Roberta's doing another part of, of the artwork. And, uh, and that would make sure that we were keeping the things in the right spot because we have to meld with the other, other two in our project. The, the fence actually goes through all the panels, but they have foliage over it. So you, you only really see it on my panel. And when you look at the picture at first, you don't see that. And uh, so I thought I would bring that element out. But how do you make a fence? So I, I tried different fabrics, didn't work. So I was taking onions out of a bag one day and I thought, onion bags. So I tried that and, and that seemed to do it. Yeah, I decided to, to add people to the project because I always think in nature, it, it's a living, breathing thing and there's animals and, and there's always people going out into nature. And, and, and I also feel that people are spending too much time in the malls with their kids and they need to bring the kids to nature. There's that healing element of, of nature and that, that grandeur and beauty. One of the exciting things about this project is that the, um, the artists we have all met, but nobody has seen what a, the other artist has done. Even though there's three of us working on one piece, I have not seen the other two um, artists work. And it'll be nice at the opening ceremony to have the same um, reaction as the public will. It'll be the first time that we see the three pieces together as one. I started in the 70s with quilting and my first quilts were very traditional quilts. They were machine pieced and hand quilted and uh, after I did a couple of quilts totally quilted by hand I decided I had to learn a faster method because I'm just too impatient to sit and work on hand quilting so I started learning how to do machine quilting and I have never looked back. I decided I was going to do one whole piece and this is the water, the water and the rocks on top of it. So I actually I found the water to be, I, I felt more comfortable with the way I had done the water than anything. So I used hand dyed fabrics and I had uh, hand dyed fabrics with lots of greens and browns in them. And then all the little, all the white swirly things, that's all quilting, that's all machine quilting, where you just run your machine and just do little circles and circles and circles. So I, I tried to go with wh how, where the picture, my picture isn't quite as, the water isn't quite as rough as it was in Roots and Gretas. And I just tried to duplicate, put more stitching where the white spots were. And so I, I I stitched all that water and then I, at the end, I did hand sew the buttons on. First of all, I decided in my wisdom that I was going to hand applique the rocks on. Well, that lasted me a bit. It lasted me for an afternoon. And I was sitting in the carport and I appliqued the rock to my skirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, this is not going to work. I so what I did for the rocks was, um, 
it's kind of a needlepoint app, a needlepoint applique method where you take the pattern, I took a tissue paper pattern, and I stitched all the way around the outside of the rock piece, and then uh, take the tissue off, and then that stitching around the, the outside helps you to define your edge, and it helps to just turn the fabric underneath, and then I just use a blind stitch on my machine, and, uh, and blind stitch around the, around the rocks to get rid of the raw edges. And I wanted a little bit of texture, and you can see some of the little textures, so I just cut little squares out of my fabric and just hand sewed them onto the, the forest and put sequins and, and things in there too because it was catching the light and it would be shiny. I put two pieces together to make the tree the tree. And I started out this wide, and then I, I stitched it down there, and I just kind of rolled it and stitched the other side down to be about the width of the tree that I wanted it to be. And then I just kind of pleated and pushed it in and stitched as I went and pushed it in until it was all quite stitched down, but still you could see the texture and some of the pleats are going this way and that way. And then uh, just a, a little bit of, of zigzag stitching over top of it. There's a little spot on my on the rock on the bottom where there's reflections on the. There's a little bit of water over top of the rock, so I thought, well, what am I going to do for that? And then actually, Greta and I kind of used almost the same technique. Quilters call them yo-yos. So I, I did a little yo-yo, except I got some of those little glass beads at the dollar store, and I stuck the little glass bead inside the yo-yo. And all the, the whole time that we were getting together all summer, Ruth would have this much done, and Greta would have this much done, and I would come with my little piece, and I'd say, oh, this is what I'm working on. And I know that they were both kind of going, oh my God, is she ever going to finish it? <laughs> Because that's another concern, like the three of us working together, we were really worried making sure that the water continued and had a flow to it and making sure that the rocks were, were basically in the same place. And, uh, and it turned out, I think, I think it turned out great. I was really happy with what we'd done. I don't normally do this because it's time consuming, but it really spoke to my heart. Um, rug hooking is uh, one of the best kept secrets of the craft. It, uh, it, uh, and it's, it was revived in Vineland uh, in the 50s. And this is why I wanted to do this piece. I wanted to sort of do it in honor of my mentors of um, of Rydermere. And uh, if they didn't uh, do what they did, we wouldn't have rug hooking, our Ontario Hooking Craft Guild in Ontario. I started with, with the um, leaf bags and it was a bit dark for me to transfer the, the canvas, so I ended up putting on tissue paper and then putting it on a, um, a permanent um, white background. And I use a light table to uh, transfer it onto the canvas. And I discovered in my second piece that it grew an inch. So what I had to do is uh, sort of stretch <laughs> my canvas, the, the paper is on the canvas and, and sort of fudge the middle so that I could get that inch in so that it could grow. And that was a bit of a challenge but I I, I, I persevered in and I figured, okay, if I get the sides right, because I have to match the two sides, that in the middle, if I fudge it a bit, that would be okay. So every once in a while, I'm going, this isn't lining up. And I'm going, oh yeah, that inch. <laughs> so, because you forget. But I figured, okay, if I can get the essence of this picture, everything else will fall into place, and, and it did. My biggest challenge was I thought it was going to take me about 300 hours to hook this thing. And uh, I was amazed. I thought, I, I thought, okay, this is 50 hours. I'm at the 50 hours. This is going to be 
uh, $200. And uh, the rest of this piece took me 100 hours. So it was 150 hours of only rug hooking, not the thought, the planning, or the dyeing. I, I got the match pretty close and left the white in so they could have, because once you dye this, I can't go on top. I have to hook it all in. And rather than doing little loops of white for the white caps, I left some white in the, the piece. And um, this is spot dyed. Okay, uh, and that's where I, I sort of scratch it in a pan. It's all wet, and then I just sort of put the, the, the uh, dye on top, and then I uh, let it bake in the oven until it's set. And I put my um, mordant, which is citric acid, on the wool before I put the dye on it, so it will bake in the oven, and then I have to wash it afterwards. I'm at the studio, and uh, this is basically what I'm doing there. Is I'm, I'm bringing up that loop with my hook, uh, and uh, there's some of my stash that I'm working with in the colors. And I'm about halfway, um, a little over halfway done on that. Uh, this is the underneath. This is what I'm holding my my uh, fingers, and when you're through, you're coming through the canvas. You can't see, but you use your hands to see and you pull it up. So that's what I'm doing underneath. I still use three for sculpturing. And um, uh, oh, my friend said, you're, not, you're gonna have to go wider <laughs> if you're gonna get it finished. So I decided, yeah, I'll go chunkier. And it, it turned out beautiful anyways. I just looked at that picture long enough to see all the colors that was in there. And it's like snow. There's so many colors in, in, in snow, but I hadn't really done brushing water before so this was a bit nerve-wracking until I got into it and it wasn't too it was a lot of patience and uh, you don't have to be an artist but you have to have patience I think that's a, the, the main thing but it's so relaxing it, it has put me through so many things in my life that were difficult My husband is a, a woodsman <laughs> by choice and uh, we've got fire pits everywhere, different sized fire pits. So I take chunks of the uh, charcoal and it's black but it's not truly black black and I remember Nina saying no black. <laughs> I'm thinking, Nina but what am I going to do? My charcoal is black but it's a natural colour and it's very soft. So I brought a rock along show you what I do. I take fabric and I work with cotton sheeting because uh, it just seems to have the, the right sort of flexibility to go over whatever surface I'm working on. And so the rocks, naturally, I had to do rocks by taking the, uh, this is a small granite chunk, but I have large rocks this size, many hundreds of them in fact on our property that were excavated by the former owner. And uh, it always fascinates me the fact that these granite boulders have come all the way from the Northland and they've ended up in Pelham. It's just truly amazing. And so I just take, oops, you can see how it crumbles. We'll have to sweep later around a little like that. And you can take your impression. And the next best thing that I really wanted to get into were the roots. I've always worked on roots. And as a painter, I've painted roots. I used to do macrame and twist fibers and do all kinds of things. The roots have always been sort of an integral part of my expression. So here are butternuts, and anyone who's used these or black walnuts knows that they produce an incredible dye. Again, you have to keep uh, your hands covered. And this is the dye that it produces. So I water this down so that it, it isn't so potent because it's pretty dark always adding, pulling and pushing, and I didn't want it to be too dark, so it has to start off light and, and get darker as it, I worked along the way. I'm using a technique of trapunto. Um, it's a, a very old traditional way of um, bringing up a three-dimensional surface, and I do a lot of work now just working with um, pastel straight on to fabric. Take soapy water. If it's where I join up all these little 
it's like joining the dots and it's mesmerizing you just you get so caught up on it in it you've got color and you start picking it up and because it's from a rock it's going to give you the right texture it's going to look like a rock when it's finished what is water it's the reflection of everything around it it's the rocks from beneath so i had to put in the rock forms and i think i picked this up when i was going through the grocery store one day and i just threw it in my um, shopping cart and i thought well maybe i'll use it and i did because this provided the most wonderful texture for the um, underneath for the water as you, you crumple it up and it just stays working pictures of ourselves so it, uh, it was a, actually a wonderful summer you know I just couldn't wait for the evenings when I got home from work or the days I had off just to spend every moment I could on this project it became actually a labor of love if you look at the picture there's a glow of light and the birches are there but it looks like it would be easy, but for me it was a real challenge getting those birches to really shine through to show that the light forth. And then something I was really looking forward to doing was applying the moss. I just had this love affair with moss on the stones. And uh, I wanted something that would tie in with the rug hooking from roots in the center panel. I actually colored um, some linen, some very coarse linen. I would, uh, I just, cut it into rough sort of freeform shapes and then pulled the edges to make them you know, fluff up a little bit to give it some texture. Line up the important things, the rocks, and uh, bring a little bit of each other's texture in our own way into each one so that there would be a continuity right through the whole project. Finally we're at uh, the end where we we're allowed to take them over to Diane's place and to have Diane and, and Nina help stretch them and Diane's husband Bill made all the frames. I'm not sure how many hours he put into doing that. So there we are. This piece was done uh, from a photograph by Anna Rittmeister. And um, when I first saw it, I thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to do this? However, I enjoy a challenge, and uh, so uh, I jumped right into it. This is the, um, the picture from which I did my particular panel. This green is the wool that I used when I was uh, making the, the cedar on the, on the hill. And I scrunched it all up, covered it with water-soluble stabilizer, and stitched and stitched and stitched. And um, when um, I had done all the stitching I could do, I uh, soaked it, and, and that uh, dissolved the stabilizer. And I was left with this, this mat of, um, of wool. Uh, which I could then tear or cut apart and use as the cedar in the trees. And this is organza, which um, made the maples on the trees, which I burned with a soldering iron and scrunched up. Uh, the rocks are made from, um, from felt which was, uh, uh, I applied a, um, 
heat gun in order to burn holes in it and uh, to give it a kind of um, a rough texture. And then I used uh, some gray pastel to give it a bit of, um, a, a, a little bit of variety here and there. This is the fabric that, the only fabric that I found that appeared to be somewhat like the water, but it definitely wasn't the right color. So what I did was I painted it white, and this, this is the original, and that seemed to blend in quite well. I then um, made some small stitches uh, from uh, in one point in another and wove this uh, yarn in through the stitches for little ripples. However, most of my new fabric is made from what I call loopy paper. And what I do is um, I get a fabric, I, I apply white glue on top of it, I scrunch up some tissue paper and lay that on top and uh, apply another coat of glue. And uh, then um, at the end, I use some metallic paint in order to give it a bit of a, of a glow. Put them on um, and I um, put a nylon tool over that to hold them in place. The leaves um, are cut from um, a product which um, I came up with, which um, consists of fabric, which is covered with white glue, and then I scrunched up some tissue paper and um, applied that on top of the glue, leaving all the wrinkles in. And um, then I put another coat of glue on it, and when it dried, I lifted it off uh, the, the surface. And what happens is that they tend to curl so that they look uh, so they are autumn leaves that are flying around. In the water, I have put some little um, ripples, and I did that by just applying some um, hand stitching and then weaving this uh, uh, fine yarn in and out, and I put some um, sequins in in order to make it sparkle. And down here, uh, I happen to have a piece of fabric that I've had I think from the beginning of the time that I started quilting one of those fabrics that I said to myself, why on earth did I buy that? <laughs> and all at once, it was exactly what I wanted. So that was, uh, that was great. It was lots of fun. inspiration in my childhood and it just so happens that my great-great-grandfather used to do um, mural paintings on walls and he did stage productions in London England and uh, that's where a lot of my family background comes from and next we'll go down to my dad and he used to bring me painting paint boxes and paper and um, crayons and colored pencils, all that, and it made me love color. He's where uh, it really, really started, but I, I like the part that there's a little history there. And uh, from there, the sewing part came when my uh, godmother, who got to babysit me an awful lot, um, would have me do cross-stitch on those little tiny squares with the little X's and there'd be a little dog or a little house or something. And my, I, I wanted so badly to make my little cross-stitches the same as hers because she was so perfect. <laughs> so those are the two beginning things. I had to make the background first and some sort of sky. So I used what they, uh, like watercolor crayons and they're not really, they're really fancy nice sticks that you can um, color with and try to make a golden behind the scene, behind the trees uh, scenery. And then I also used rubber stamps, two different color brownings to make that shadowy effect in the background. Then it came down to the rocky part and the water was, uh, I, I was so glad when they said, this is yours th to do, the water. And I thought, oh, I love water, I love waterfalls. Uh, any place we go, I have to take pictures of waterfalls. Well, 
<laughs> Everyone said, oh, I'm glad I didn't get it. I'm glad you ended up with it. Well, Maury has part of it, which actually with her technique and the other techniques here, it ended up being okay. And when we finally met, it seemed to go together really good. And uh, the leaves, they were fun to do. I could have had more in maybe, but they're, they look good. And then I love beadwork. I love to do beadwork. And uh, I like to embroider. There's a little bit of that on here, and which is probably hard to find. No, there you can see it. And uh, it was making the three different falls look like they came in three sections to come down, if you look at the photograph. And uh, the rocks, I love putting all the beads on them ecstatic that this has happened to me. This is like a highlight for my life and uh, I enjoyed the process very, very much. It took a long time and it, a lot of thought and a lot of walking around. What do I do next? You know? but. the challenge because um, landscape is not an area that I normally work in. I, I'm a portrait painter primarily and I do figurative work more even though I totally am in love with the Niagara landscape. So this was a great opportunity for me to um, to you know have a chance to sort of play around with that and um, we had these great photographs to work from um, and uh, I decided to use my the normal uh, materials that I do use, just so I had some sense of comfort in what I was doing, and, and that is that I work on plastic, which is kind of unusual. Um, and I, I think that plastic sometimes in this modern age gets a bit of a bad rap, you know, there's sort of a prejudice against it. But um, I like to use it, and, and I've been able to source uh, plastic that is intended for artists. It's called Duralar, so it's it's uh, archival, uh, it won't yellow, it's very um, uh, sturdy, very strong uh, material. So it's flexible, uh, but not as flexible as saran wrap, let's say. It's quite thick, but not as thick as plexiglass. So, so it does have that ability to bend. Um, and so what I do is I start with clear like uh, Duralar, and then I top that with uh, tissue paper, which is again artist grade tissue paper. It's usually cut into ovals and they overlap one another and this creates kind of a, a semi-transparent surface and on, on which I draw. So um, I also use felt, or flocking people call it. So on the back of this panel, you would see sort of an abstract design, which I start with in flocking or felt and that um, that transfers through to the front and um, I sort of start from chaos I like to start from chaos and then come to order in the piece so so I start with that sort of abstract design and then I and then I draw onto it so as I said it is it is quite a process and it and because it starts somewhat chaotically sometimes I'm not really sure if it's if I'm going to be able to bring it over to to an image, like a perceivable image. So I think I worked on it for maybe, um, gosh, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And, I, and then I realized that it had totally gotten away from me, the piece, and that there was just no way I was going to be able to, to, to get the image to read in with, uh, with that abstract pattern. So I had to throw away the whole first you know, the first attempt at, at this. And then I, I, I started again, and, uh, and it worked a little better the second time. So, so up at the top, um, it's, it's mostly drawing. So what I use is, um, they're, they're wax-based pencils. So they have a kind of a, a, almost like a greasy, waxy feel to them. And, and you can even, heat that, that pencil and, and make it a little more blurry. 
um, and, and move it around a little bit. So there's a lot of drawing and, and heating and drawing and and um, and that's most most of the top part. Then I've also included some text in in. The, the ground area, um, and that's just because recently I've been doing writing, like poetry, and it, even though it's not actual poetry, but I just like the idea of including text and imagery or combining text and imagery together. Uh, another difficult area for me, and, and I'm sure it was a challenge for just about everybody, anybody who was dealing with leaves of any sort had to have you know, really had to sit down and think, okay, how am I going to approach this, right? And there's so many interesting solutions to that problem, I think, in, in all three of these panels. Um, I did what, uh, you know, I think both Karen and Roberta did in their pieces here, and that we kind of treated the leaves at some points as clumps, and then at other points as individual leaves, like j just bringing out a few individual leaves as well. There's, there, this is the most transparent part of the piece, and I do recall working actually from the back to the front, so that the, there is actually, because this is transparent and it's plastic, it actually has a sh natural shine to it, which is what water has as well, so I think that's why it comes across that way as wet. I think that this was probably um, the first collaborative piece of work that I've ever done. I'm accustomed to working just as a single artist. And it was a really, um, I wondered whether it would come together, I think, because you always, you know, you don't know what two thirds of your, your group are gonna be doing. We have no control over that. So we actually met um, tw twice and looked at our pieces as we were as we were progressing with them and it that was delightful actually to, to get to know these two ladies and to to see the work you know speaking to one another at early stages and then that that, that influenced how you went forward with your work so it really did become a collaboration and, and and for me that was that was one of the really enjoyable parts of the project but i just think that nina and and uh, diane did such an amazing job putting this together and giving us all, like trusting us and giving us all the freedom we needed and yet getting this up, done on time and, and ending with such a, you know, fabulous result.